Welcome back, everyone. A big thank you to the previous panel for that terrific discussion. And before introducing our next panel on climate change, I would like to, uh, to briefly set the stage. When Erskine Bowles and I founded the Economic Strategy Group, it was with the goal of focusing on big structural long-term challenges to the US economy. And quite frankly, I can't think of any more certain and formidable long-term structural challenge than climate change. And I think about this challenge as a threefold challenge. First, we're gonna to need to provide enough affordable electricity to make it available to the 3 billion who are gonna need it uh, in the decades ahead. So that's significant in and of itself. Secondly, we need to prepare for the climate change induced extreme weather shocks that are sure to come no matter what we do. And thirdly, of course, we need to decarbonize a global economy, which is 80% reliant on carbon-based fuels if we're gonna avoid the worst uh, uh, outcomes going forward. Another very hard truth, even if we meet all of the voluntary targets set by the Paris Agreement, the whole world meets those targets, the earth is still going to overheat to the point we're going to have dangerous sea level rises and, uh, and extreme weather shocks. And of course, we're not even coming close to meeting those targets. So I think it's pretty obvious to most people by now that is, it is helpful as these UN voluntary targets are, and they are helpful, they're insufficient. But we're gonna need new structures. We're gonna need a structure, I believe, with teeth that focuses on the major economies, uh, deals very squarely with the, uh, the incentives to free ride and the tendency to free ride, and provides real incentives uh, to reduce carbon. And we're going to need more than that because we're, we're going to need, if we're going to get anywhere with this to, to avoid the worst outcomes, we're, we're going to need some major technological breakthroughs like direct air capture, which will allow us to capture carbon, which is already in the atmosphere. So as I see it, we need to see a major effort right away to spur game-changing technological breakthroughs as well as a huge effort to roll out all of the you know, promising commercially viable technologies that we should be relying on to a greater extent. So I'm really hoping that this post-COVID post moment provides an opportunity to implement some bold solutions to adapt our, econo to our, adapt our economic model, because that's what it's gonna take to adapt that economic model the one that puts us on a less dangerous path. Now, this is going to be an uphill climb, but the task will be made much easier by some of the creative thinking and concrete policy ideas put forward by the leaders on our next panel. So I'm now gonna hand this off to Jillian Tett, who will introduce and moderate the next panel. Now, Jillian is a very able US editor of the Financial Times who has made a big focus on climate change. So Jillian, thank you for all you're doing and over to you with this panel. Thank you very much indeed, Secretary Paulson. And it's a great delight and honor to be taking part in this extremely important debate, which is obviously happening on the fifth anniversary of the Paris Climate Change Accord. So welcome to all of you. As you have just heard from Secretary Paulson in fairly stark terms, um, one of the messages of the report, which I commend to you all, is that there is no single magic bullet, no single magic wand at the moment that is going to solve all these problems just by itself. There needs to be many, many different steps um, taken, many tools and levers used to try and put the planet on a better um, path. We spend a lot of time at the Financial Times right now writing about that. It's a top priority for us. And we take pride in trying to pull together both the science and the social aspects and the politics and policy 
but also the money and the business, because that's another very, very important part of the equation. So we have a fantastic group of people to talk to us from these different perspectives. And um, we have Trevor Heiser, who's from the Rhodium Group, David Keat from the Harvard Kennedy School, both of whom have contributed to the volume, which you have hopefully seen. Roberta Williams, who's from the University of Maryland, from the Climate Leadership Council, who can talk to us about the issues of taxes and other issues like that. And Kate Gordon, who's from the California Governor's Office of Planning and Research, who can give us a practical policy perspective about what this means on the ground. So perhaps I should start with Trevor, since you have contributed a chapter to this policy document, telling us what do you think is possible, just how serious is the issue, and what are you recommending? And I'm going to go down all of the panelists one by one to briefly give a, lay out their key ideas. We'll have a debate and then bring in some questions from the audience. We already have some terrific questions from you, but if you have additional questions, do please send them in and I'll try and weave them together in the conversation. So Trevor, over to you. Great, thanks, Jillian. Great to be with everyone. Uh, maybe I can set the table by laying out the problem uh, in uh, some detail. The, uh, our understanding of the risks of climate change has advanced really considerably over the past few years, and not just on the scientific side, but in the economics community, uh, thanks to an explosion of big data econometric research. Uh, and that research uh, really was accelerated by uh, leadership from Hank and from Kate Gordon, who's on this panel through the Risky Business Project in 2014. And what we're learning uh, from this new research is both that the magnitude of the macroeconomic risk of climate change is larger than we thought. So in the US, by 2030, the aggregate cost of climate change can be on par with having a COVID style disruption once every decade. Uh, and the public health risk is much larger than uh, we thought. Uh, new research suggests that by the end of the century, changes in temperature alone will increase global mortality rates uh, on par with all infectious diseases combined. Uh, but equally importantly, what we're learning from this research is that the impacts of climate change are very unequally spread, both within the U.S. and around the world. And low-income communities and low-income countries are disproportionately impacted. So a hot day kills many more people in Delhi than it does in Dallas because Delhi is less adapted, less rich. Uh, sea level rise disproportionately impacts lower income households in the US. Heat waves reduces educational performance and test scores more in low income schools than high income schools. So tying this back to the previous panel, the challenges of inequality that both the US and other countries are facing now are only exacerbated by a warming climate. Uh, there are a number of recommendations that uh, I outline in the chapter for how to address that inequality of impact in particular as we think about our overall response to climate change. Uh, and the first is to remember that while there's a lot of talk about targets and timetables, and we'll talk about that here, the goal to get goals to get to net zero emissions by 2050, uh, to get the electric power sector decarbonized by different dates, the path to your target matters as much as the ultimate target. Every ton reduced has a measurable benefit, uh, both in the US and around the world, and that benefit disproportionately accrues to low-income communities and low-income countries. Uh, second, that that new research on the inequality of impact needs to be factored into the policymaking process, both the regulatory process and the legislative process, uh, whether that's in the development of the social cost of carbon or in how we allocate resources for resilience funding uh, to deal with the impacts of climate that are, uh, that are, that are already baked in and likely to, uh, uh, to continue. Uh, the third point I'd like to make is that, as Hank said in the, in the uh, intro, regardless of how successful we are in reducing emissions, there is warming that's already occurred and is likely to continue. Investment now in making impacted communities more resilient uh, can play a dual role of both accelerating economic recovery and making our economy more resilient to shocks in the future. Uh, and then the final point that I would make is that uh, the, U.S. is more vulnerable than many developed countries 
but it's much less vulnerable than many developing countries. And the disproportionate impact on developing countries will increasingly lead to migration pressures here in the US. And because a lot of that damage is caused by historical omissions from the US, uh, we believe the US has a moral responsibility to accommodate those refugees in ways that we've accommodated other categories of refugees. And so one uh, recommendation that we outline in the chapter is that the US set up a, a temporary protective status program for climate change. Uh, and a good case study of how you would apply that is, uh, is Hurricane Eta right now and the impact it's had in Guatemala, uh, that in the same way that we've extended temporary protective status for other natural disasters that we should increasingly do so for climate. So let me stop there. Well, thank you, Trevor. Um, a lot of very sober warnings, a lot of pretty bold policy ideas. Some of those policy ideas seem pretty hard to imagine ever being embraced right now, and certainly not in recent years. But one thing we have learned in recent years that we all need to imagine the unimaginable sometimes, and the zeitgeist can change, and indeed is changing very rapidly indeed right now. So um, I'd like to ask um, David Keith, please, from Harvard Kennedy School to share your perspective, and then I'll turn to Rob and Kate. Thank you. Um, so there are four basic things we can do about climate change, four basic response modes. The first is to decarbonize the economy, to shift the industrial infrastructure of the planet away from carbon intensive fossil fuels to solar, nuclear, wind, what have you, carbon free energy. That's the central thing we have to do. We can also remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, carbon dioxide removal. We can also do what's called solar radiation modification or solar climate intervention, ideas of deliberately intervening into the climate system somehow to make the earth more reflective and reduce some of the net risks, maybe with accompanying new risks. And the fourth is adaptation, which is kind of AKA climate resiliency, ways that we locally make uh, societies and ecosystems less vulnerable to climate changes. So these four things, I think we need to take them all seriously but they do different things and they have different natural, uh, uh, natural sequencing, timing sequencing um, uh, in, in climate policy. So decarbonization acts on the fundamental source term. It's the one thing that is absolutely clear we must do. The, the long-term driver of climate risk is putting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide removal allows us to do something that you cannot do by emissions cuts. Even if we cut emissions to zero, Historical emissions are still driving warming and carbon dioxide removal could allow us to bring down carbon concentrations, the amount of carbon in the atmosphere, the thing that actually drives climate change on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, that's a very important thing and it's fundamentally complementary of decarbonization. Uh, it's important to say there are really two categories of carbon removal. One are things that are effectively permanent, that really reduce long-run risk, biomass with carbon capture and storage, direct air capture with carbon capture and storage, adding alkalinity to the ocean. Those things may or may not make sense. They may or may not have higher low costs, but it's clear they really represent permanent removals. Then there's a bunch of things that are fundamentally short term, adding to the carbon stock in trees, which I think would be better called carbon banking or in some ways delayed emissions. And uh, while they may well be very good policy tools, there are fundamental limits to the extent to which they uh, reduce long run climate risks. Um, uh, solar radiation modification, I, I think no one would say it's something that we definitely should do. My view is it's one of the important things we could do. And its key, uh, um, key feature is that it can act relatively quickly, that it doesn't have the very long inertia that decarbonization and carbon removal have and that it appears on current evidence that it could substantially reduce risks globally, but it's fundamentally a band-aid. It's masking the underlying risk term from the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So it can't substitute for carbon removal, which really can reduce that long run risk term. And then finally adaptation, which are all these measures that, that Trevor referred to that can allow communities to reduce their risks. And there's a bunch of crucially important uh, uh, adaptation measures. Um, one new feature in this paper is some work uh, that comes from a range of papers, including one that both my co-author John Deutsch has been involved in, a separate paper that I've been involved in, that have done early versions of optimal economic modeling of these instruments over time. This is in this 
you know, universe that economists like where there's a global uh, benevolent uh, dictator for the world, which is obviously not the world we live in. But you can learn something from those models about timing. And I think the individual numbers we get out of those models don't mean much, but there is something meaningful in the sequence. And the lesson is decarbonization first, it may be SRM second, and then large scale carbon removal, which is different from how most people think about it, which is we first do decarbonization and somehow if that fails, whatever that means, because it can't fail, this is an issue of politics, then we do carbon removal and then maybe in the distant future we do SRM. Our argument is that there are real reasons to believe that's the wrong order, although we can't say and nor can anyone else whether or not it makes sense to take SRM seriously. Thanks. Thank you. And I think one of the messages from this is that, as I said before, there is no single magic, um, you know, silver bullet or magic wand. We're going to be having to look at a range of strategies. That, of course, makes it tough because, um, you know, it's hard enough for policymakers to deal with one big policy challenge. If you're trying to do, uh, roll out a kind of multi-led approach with other governments is part of the um, issue right now. But um, obviously, as policymakers are going to have to learn to walk and chew gum um, in this respect and both look at these different strategies and the social impact um, and inequality issues. Um, Rob, tell us what you're thinking about in terms of the kind of policy measures that your group, the Climate Leadership Council, is trying to develop right now and how business and finance can play a role. I'll talk about that. I also want to... Um... There's a third paper in addition to David's and Trevor's um, by Gib Metcalf um, that, uh, that I want to talk about uh, at least a little bit at the beginning of this. Um, it's an excellent paper, um, provides a great overview on carbon pricing, specifically a carbon tax, and particularly how to address some of the key concerns under carbon pricing. Um, if I were in an academic seminar, I'd be focusing on stuff where Gib and I disagree, um, but I'd, I'd have to nitpick if I were going to do that. But, uh, um, Gib and I agree on all the big picture points, so talking about his paper lets me say a lot of things that I would say anyway. Um, I can only briefly summarize and everybody should read the paper, it's excellent. Um, a carbon price imposing a cost on emissions of greenhouse gases such as carbon is a necessary centerpiece of any cost effective climate policy, or at least of the carbon emissions reduction piece that David was just talking about. Um, you could do that with cap and trade, but a carbon tax has significant advantages. Um, Gibbs paper talks first about some of the key design elements, um, then discusses other policies to complement a carbon tax and examines economic effects. Um, so one concern that often comes up is emissions uncertainty. Uh, a carbon tax sets a carbon price, but lets the market determine the emissions. Um, you can build in an automatic tax adjustment mechanism to address that. If emissions are higher than you want them to be, the tax automatically adjusts upward. You could put in something else that if it, emissions are lower than you were targeting, uh, the tax adjusts down. Um, that, can, that can sort of add more certainty about emissions. Um, there's also a need to address international trade issues that if the US puts in a price and other countries don't and carbon intensive industries simply move overseas, that imposes a cost on the US and there's no climate benefit at all. Um, a border carbon adjustment can, can address that kind of issue. Um, there's also the question, sort of, what other policies do you need? Once you have a carbon price, there's no need for the other policies to address the priced emissions. So you could eliminate those other policies, but that doesn't fix everything. You still need regulations for the greenhouse gas emissions that aren't priced, um, methane being probably the biggest example of that. Uh, very hard to price. Um, local air pollutants, you need policies to support research and development, to address equity issues, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, uh, and finally, Gibb talks about evidence that the carbon price doesn't significantly affect overall economic growth, um, but does cause substantial shifts. You get more jobs in some industries, less in others. Uh, so policy needs to help those who lose out from those shifts. One thing I'd emphasize a bit more is, as, as Trevor was talking about, unchecked climate change will cause economic harm. And we know that other ways of reducing emissions cost more than a carbon price. So saying a carbon price doesn't affect economic growth, that's relative to doing nothing. Well, you also avoid the climate damage. Um, so that's clearly, it's clearly the best economic option available. Let me add two quick points at the end here. First, I want to emphasize that carbon tax is the core of emissions reduction policy. 
There's a misconception out there that a carbon price or carbon tax is a way to pay for climate policy. And that's wrong. The price is the climate policy. Um, the price itself creates a strong incentive to reduce emissions. So you get major reductions in emissions, even if you use the revenue for something that has nothing to do with the environment. You can use it to address other needs. Uh, as one example, I'm working with the Climate Leadership Council on their carbon dividend plan, which uses that revenue for dividends to all Americans. So that's an approach that has real political advantages, and it especially helps the poor and middle class, which is, is something we, we need given current inequality issues. Um, second, a common issue people bring up is the political feasibility of a carbon price, and that's overblown. It's certainly a challenge. Um, it's a substantial challenge. But I think people overestimate the challenge and underestimate the political difficulty of any equally effective alternative or, over time, of continuing to do nothing. Now, obviously, you need the right proposal for a carbon price, and the political moment needs to be right. But I'd argue that moment's a lot closer than most people think. So, stop there. Thanks. Right. Well, one of the questions, we've already got some great questions from the audience, and one of them is, whether or not you think any of this is politically feasible or not. And of course, we are sitting at a very delicate moment in terms of transitions. Um, so it's going to be an interesting year next year. But even before that, we have Kate, who can tell us, having heard what the scientists, researchers, academics think, what is actually like to be on the front lines of actually putting some of these br brilliant ideas into practice in a state like California. You know, what are you doing? What is possible and what could change? Thanks so much. And it is it is great to be here and really an honor to um, have have been put in a position to respond to these amazing papers. Um, you know, California is I think sometimes people think, oh, you know, California is not like anywhere else. It's its own thing. I just just a reminder that we're the fifth largest economy in the world. We're also a very diversified economy. We have an oil and gas sector. We have the largest manufacturing sector in the United States. Uh, we have a lot of rural economic activity. So really it is quite a diverse economy. And I think an interesting microcosm of some of the issues that we're looking at throughout the United States. And the reality is that in California, we are dealing with every one of the things that just came up in this conversation so far. Um, let me start with with Trevor's point. And, and I've been, been lucky enough to get to work with Trevor on some of these issues in the past. Current climate impacts in California are significant. Um, everyone knows, I think, we've had the biggest wildfire year in terms of acreage burned, over 4 million acres this year. We've had four of the, all four, August, September, October, November, the hottest months on record um, for California. So it's been really a significant year. And, and I'm pointing to that because I think sometimes people don't realize the fiscal impact that that has in a state like many states, we have a balanced budget requirement, so we can't do deficit spending. When we turn over our budget to emergency response, it means we're not spending on other things. Um, that also, and I actually, uh, I, Trevor uh, hosted, a Rodium Group hosted a panel last week that was incredibly interesting on these economic impacts. And one thing I learned on that panel, but I've also experienced in California, is the direct impact or relationship between um, climate disasters and the safety net. So the more we spend, the more climate disasters we have, the more we actually spend on helping those vulnerable communities that Trevor talked about with unemployment, with food stamps, with relocation. So all of our budget kind of higher and higher and higher in response. And as an example, we spent a billion dollars on firefighting this year in California. That's three times what we budgeted. And that was literally just firefighting people and equipment. So I bring that up because uh, it's, it's very relevant to what both David and Rob talked about. Every dollar we spend, the more we spend on emergencies and safe related safety net programs, the less we have to spend on everything David just talked about, on emissions reductions, on carbon removal, on adaptation and resilience over the long term. It's ex what we're seeing is a shift away from those longer term thinking into emergency response, which just puts a point on how important it is to get ahead of it. Um, but it's a balancing act that's very hard for us at the state level. And so it's why we're so, so dependent on the federal government to both buttress our safety net spending so we can redirect some of those funds and also to support the longer term research and development, the longer term resilience efforts, the longer term pieces that we really need to put in place so that we don't have that, that budget reality. 
Uh, I will say, uh, you know, to Rob's point and, and the Metcalf paper on carbon taxes, I agree that they are, they are incredibly useful. Car pricing carbon is incredibly useful. We've been doing it in California since 2006 with a cap and trade program. I agree it's not a revenue generating policy. However, let me just say that the only reason we still have any money to spend on anything other than emergency response is because we have a dedicated cap and trade fund program that is separate from our general fund and has to be spent on emissions reductions and related programs. And so that's the place where we are still able to look for, for some of those key programs. And so it's been incredibly helpful to us. The upside is that it doesn't get colonized by these other issues. The downside is that it's a dedicated program. And so it, it can lead to a political thought that it's the only place we fund this stuff. It can lead to siloing your funding for, for those critical issues. Ideally, and this is where we're trying to get in California, we should be integrating thinking about reducing our climate risks and thinking about capturing these opportunities of these new technologies and programs and protecting vulnerable communities throughout and providing access to them. We should be doing that across all of our spending, across infrastructure, across all of our assets, across all of our agencies and programs, because ultimately this is a government-wide uh, issue. And, uh, and that, to Trevor's point, has to be incorporated into our budget, regulatory, and policy programs. The last thing I'll say, and I know this is a lot, but, but it is kind of top of mind for us as we're putting our January budget together. This is what I'm thinking about every minute of the day. We are really convinced in California of the need to have this be a cross-agency uh, approach, um, not to confine climate action and climate policy to env the environmental agencies, but really to say this is an economic issue, this is a fiscal issue, this is a health issue, this is an agriculture issue. Example from California, a very specific one, and it actually goes to something David talked about, um, is our work on forest biomass or, or wonky term woody feedstock uh, from the forest. We have a whole bunch of wood coming out of the forest that we need to get out because we're doing forest management to help reduce our wildfire risk. That's important for health. It's important for our climate emissions. It's just important because we have 11 million people living in high fire risk areas. It's a big deal. We uh, need to get that wood out. We would like the private sector to help us. We have a forest sector or a forest set of communities that frankly didn't do a just transition strategy when timber went away. They were left with almost no infrastructure, with very few roads, with not a lot of workforce skills. We're coming back in and saying we have to rebuild that in order to create community economic development strategies that take that non-merchantable wood out of the forests and use it for things like, um, to David's point, potentially BEX, um, hydrogen, uh, for fuels, sustainable aviation fuel is a growing market, for cross-laminated timber, for a set of sustainable wood products and, and, and uh, wood-based products that could also build out those sectors of the economy. That's the kind of integrated approach we need to take. And that's a strategy that we're doing across seven agencies of our government in California. And it's, it's a truly integrated strategy. So I'll leave it at that. Um, I know that was a lot, but um, this really is top of mind for us in California. Well, that is fascinating. Thank you. And a very nice collection of perspectives. Um, I can see that we've already got a lot of questions jumping in um, or flooding in. We've got quite a few in the beginning. We've got quite a few more now. So I'm actually going to go straight to audience questions because many of the questions are ones I would have asked myself anyway. Um, and I'd like to start with a question, I think, both for Trevor and for David, which is this. Um, as to climate change, don't you think it's too late to avoid dramatic consequences? If not, why not? We're saying, are we all doomed already? Uh, and ab absolutely not. I mean, that what we've seen over the past few years is just the uh, is just a precursor to some really disruptive, both economically and societally, changes uh, that we'll face if emissions stay on the past trajectory. Uh, there are uh, there are two very different futures in front of us right now. One is where the heat waves and hurricanes and wildfires 
that we've experienced over the past few years become increasingly frequent, uh, increasingly regular, where portions of the world become challenging for uh, human habitability on a full time basis, where major cities are submerged underwater, um, or a future where the impacts are a little bit worse than they are today, but not that much worse. And that choice is still, there's, it's, it's very unlikely we're going to undo the level of change in the climate that we've seen already, but it is still entirely possible to limit the change to only marginally worse than we're experiencing right now. Okay. There's a huge gap between uh, doomed and 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 significant risk. So I think there's no, I mean, there already are significant climate consequences. So we're not avoiding the fact that there's consequences, but uh, I think there are actually a few scenarios under which it's doomed. I mean. I'm a generation that grew up worrying all my time about nuclear war, I still do. I, I think that actually one of the challenges of climate is this kind of this creeping awful thing, but it's not a sharp existential threat as much as, I mean, if it really was, it'd be easier to solve the politics. The problem is in a way that it isn't. Um, uh, I, I would poke at Trevor a little bit. He said it's very unlikely that we would reduce the level of risk. He might be right, but that just to be clear is implicitly saying that we would choose never to do carbon removal uh, to reduce net uh, concentrations or that we would never use solar radiation management uh, uh, to reduce overall climate changes for a given amount of CO2. And those might be correct judgments, but to be clear, those are choices, not things that are fixed by the physics of the problem or the tools we have. Yeah, that's entirely correct. So what David uh, it is, it, there's nothing that would technically or in the physics prevent you from not just going back to pre-industrial levels, but pulling additional CO2 out of the air to make it even colder than pre-industrial levels. Uh, uh, that was more a statement of what I think is both politically and technically likely, that I think that the high water mark would be limiting damages at where they are now, so, not so reversing past warming. Maybe, but just to keep the ball bouncing for a second, is that that you just, how do you think about the asymmetry of solar geoengineering and the emerging evidence, which may be wrong, from now a wide suite of climate models based on observations that it could substantially reduce climate risks in most places? Given that and the fact that it's easy to do, the push for some groups of countries, coalitions that are seeing big climate damages, the incentive for them to use these technologies seems to be quite high. Let's, uh, let's hope you're right. So there are actually things that could be done, which is obviously very um, encouraging to at least try and start, you know, talking about this in a slightly more serious multi multi pronged strategy. Um, I'm just curious, though, it's a question, I'd love to ask you a question, which I often ask people, and it came out of a panel that I moderated at the Aspen Ideas Festival um, 18 months ago, back in the days when we still had Aspen Ideas Festivals. Um, with McKinsey, and I was with um, McKinsey, who were talking about the threats to the climate, and the point when the audience woke up so completely that they didn't look at their phones for an hour was when one of the panelists said that he would never dream of getting a condo in Florida these days, given all the risks, um, particularly, you know, oceanfront co condos, because people were ignoring those. So I'm just curious, and um, both Trevor and David, would you buy a condo in Florida right now next to the beach? So uh, let me be a little provocative. So I, I personally don't like Florida much and I like mountains, not beaches. So I'm personally not interested, but, but I think this is the challenge of climate. It, it, as much as is, is over half a century, it's this huge impact. You know, on the timescale that most humans make real decisions, the impacts aren't that large. We in the academic community are finding all these ways to kind of analyze those impacts and turn the knobs to 11 to try and incite policy. But the fact is, if I'm buying a condo in Florida now for most places, I'd be worried about a series of other shocks to the US financial system or other changes in my life that everybody has. But on realistic timescale that people really make decisions about property, climate change is not such a huge thing. So, so I think David's right that people don't make housing decisions based on the climate science. I think that's that's true. But I do think that we are starting to see the private sector price these things into decision making much more than they used to. So Realtor.com yeah. now has disclosure of climate events, including flooding in all of its properties. Insurance companies are increasingly looking at, uh, uh, you know, and we see this in California, I mean, uh, either not insuring anymore or dramatically changing rates based on climate events. Uh, 
ratings agencies, bond issuers are starting to incorporate some of these things. And so I think there is actually a, a kind of an underground pricing of risk going on across a number of industries. And some governments are taking it kind of to the next level. We're seeing that in the UK, for instance. Uh, President-elect Biden's Build Back Better plan includes required climate risk disclosure as one of the first 100 days priorities. And so we see this as kind of a growing movement. And so to David's point, I don't actually think that it's the top of mind thing for most people making those decisions. I do think that in the financial markets, those who make longer term decisions are starting to feel the real fiscal impact of these events and are starting to price them in. To Trevor's point, that will have unequal consequences and, in a big I, way on lower income Americans and across the world as well. Actually, relevant anecdote. I had a house in Calgary that was flooded in a flood that was the 100 year max flood and very likely climate related. And CBC News had climate scientists in front of a flooded house. But again, you look at the data, it's a combination of different factors, including land use change. And I'm now actually in the middle of building another house in a place that's a floodplain and I'm building it. And I think I'm a rational person. <laughs> I think that, yeah, so, David, so, do, you, do, you, do you build it? Do you, do you incorporate the cost of doing it? I think to some extent, yeah. we see this in the fire risk areas of California. If people want to be in the middle of the forest, then I would like them to have to think about building a microgrid and think about internalizing some of those costs. If, totally. uh, but in general, we as government need to be organizing our investments, our subsidy, and our programs away from those high-risk decisions. Can, can so let I me say what the leading, the leading indicator we use. So we did a lot of the flood modeling for First Street Foundation that's now in Realtor and Redfin. And as a leading indicator, the number of complaint calls that come in from realtors who are now losing sales because people are showing up to the open house with a tear sheet. Because for the first time, before this was available, no one could find out how their flood risk was changing for their home. And people are showing up with a tear sheet to the open houses. And the question is not, do I live in Florida or do I not? It's do I live in this house or do I buy a house that is five blocks away and has a substantially lower flood risk, but maybe the same amenity value, right? So I'm not asking someone to completely relocate the state in which they live, which is very challenging. Um, and that's, I think, where you're gonna see a lot of, and could see some pretty abrupt changes in asset price valuation as that kind of information becomes more ubiquitous. But well, we're covering you know, a little bit. Just a quick, the, it's important that this is starting to get priced into decisions about where to invest and how climate resilient to make your investment. It, I want to make it very clear that's not a substitute for emissions pricing. That that private pricing is just affecting, you know, if you've got a company that's thinking of putting a, a, a new play, you know, new factory or new you know, major investment in somewhere that's very climate vulnerable, it gives them incentive to avoid that but it doesn't give them any incentive to reduce their emissions and therefore to mitigate the problem. Um, but that's a, that's a global externality. It's not something that, that this sort of private pricing, now it may create political pressure that then makes it easier to put in the carbon pricing. Um, I think it is doing that, but it doesn't directly create the incentive for any of these companies to reduce their own emissions. Well, except Rob that, um... Uh, the way that the financial markets are looking at this through the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures Framework, which I think many people are gravitating toward as a framework, both the physical risk disclosure piece, which we've all been talking about, which is sort of the house and flooding, but they're also, and a lot of countries are actually much more serious about this, looking at transition risk. So they're actually looking at disclosure of the risk that if they do something that's high emission or that's high carbon, that it will become a stranded asset, that it will become, that it will not be part of a long-term transition. So if I'm making a 30-year investment, I need to be paying attention to climate policy, to global trends, to you know, new technology advancements. I think that goes more to your point, although it, it I does, personally I am less confident that that works on the private sector side as well as it does on the public sector side. I was just gonna say exactly that. That I, I think that that creates some pressure, but it doesn't create anywhere near enough pressure. Well, I was going to say that, you know, I mean, two, two observations. One is that the minute one people stop talking about what science, which to many people is quite abstract, and start talking about realtors and condos, the whole thing becomes much more immediate and everyone gets very animated as just this display just now.
Um, but um, secondly, the question about pricing and how that is or is not being absorbed or modeled in the private sector, I think is fascinating. And in fact, anyone who's watching who hasn't yet seen this thing called Moral Money, which is um, a platform we have at the Financial Times, because we're covering this a lot um, on the question of how the private sector is responding and behaving and the gap, for example, between the yawning chasm between what mortgage banks have been using for their model versus the reinsurance industry, which is where a lot of the smart money and modeling is right now. Um, you know, we covered that kind of thing a lot and TCFT is gonna be fascinating in terms of the impact it has. I mean, anyone who thinks that the Biden administration's main impact is going to be on shale gas is missing a big trick there in terms of what could happen in the financial sector um, fairly swiftly. But um, another question I'd like to ask, particularly to Rob, is on the issue of carbon taxes, carbon dividends. Um, I often say that it's called carbon dividends because if it's called a carbon tax, the Republicans will have a meltdown. Um, it's a way of getting bipartisan um, support, um, a bit like calling it environmental protection, not climate change. Um, but the question here is, could you discuss the prospects um, of a carbon tax not attached to a carbon dividend? Do you think we're likely to have any straightforward carbon tax as opposed to a carbon dividend or even just carbon pricing um, under the next administration? So it's, I mean, it's much easier to sell people on something that they benefit from than something that'll cost them money. Um, and so, you know, if you think about, you know, you, 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 when you're trying to sell people an idea, you tell them all the things, all the ways that'll help them. And you probably tell them sort of the other side too, but you don't put, you know, you don't emphasize that. You don't make that the upfront lead. And for a long time, economists have sort of been focused on carbon tax, carbon tax, carbon tax. And that's sort of putting the emphasis on the part that costs people money, not the what you're going to get piece of it. Um, and the, the people who understand politics, um, unfortunately, everybody at the, the Climate Leadership Council understands politics better than I do. Um, but, you know, I'm the, the economist in the room. Um, they, they've grasped that idea. And that you know the, the policy it's it's a carbon fee and dividend, but fee doesn't show up in the name. Dividend does. Um, the prospect for doing something, I mean, I, I think you know you, you can certainly tell people the environmental benefits, um, but a lot of those benefits, you know, they're they're happening pretty far into the future. I I care a lot about my kids. I care about my grandkids, but a lot of people are focused you know on what they get right now, um, and and don't have the luxury of thinking about the future uh, or the distant future. Um, and so emphasizing what the right now benefits are, um, that doesn't have to be a dividend, but there has to be something that sort of gives a, um, an additional reason to like the policy other than just the long-term climate benefits. Um, so I, I think it'll be hard to, um, you know, you know a, a number of years ago, sort of six or seven years ago, I wrote a paper about um, using a carbon tax to pay down the budget deficit. It's a great long run policy. But one of the things we showed is every generation that could vote right now would be worse off under that policy than if we did nothing. That makes it hard to pass. Um, so, so I think the, the what you get has to be a key piece of the, the political aspect of it. Right. I mean, I guess one of the questions I have that coming out of that is, um, you know, do you attribute much chance to a bipartisan consensus on this front? Because I know the Climate Leadership Council was created to try and promote a bipartisan agenda um, around this idea of, you know, carbon dividend, not tax, um, around the idea of environmental protection, not too much chatter about climate change, um, or even stewardship, which is a word which commands a lot of uh, respect in some Republican supporting circles. Um, but do you think there's much chance of getting any kind of bipartisan action on this front in the next um, term? That's a great question. Um, I, I think to have any kind of serious, durable policy change at the national level, it has to be bipartisan. That the, the idea that you're gonna be able to push something through with just one party pushing it um, and that you can do something that will do a lot, 
and then won't get immediately pulled out the moment the next president comes in. Um, it has to be bipartisan. Um, and I think there is potential for that. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult to say, you know, the, the moment has to be right, um, but there are Republicans who support um, the climate dividends, you know, the carbon dividends plan or, or various other version of policies like that. Um, and I would, I mean, politics is a little unpredictable. Uh, you have to be ready when the, the moment strikes. Um, if you'd predicted where the Republican Party would be right now, you know, nobody would have predicted that six or seven years ago. Um, and if you go back to the history of the Republican Party, um, the Clean Air Act was passed under a Republican president, signed into law by a Republican president. The 1990 Clean Air Act amendments uh, were passed under a Republican president, signed into law by a Republican president. Um, the Republican Party has a long history of you know, conservation and conservative have the same root work. Um, and the sort of where the Republican Party is now and where it might be a couple of years from now, um, it, it, it'll be interesting to see. Um, I will say it's getting harder and harder to do nothing on climate change. That's becoming a less and less acceptable position. And if you think about the things that involve doing something, it's basically stringent regulation, um, spend a lot of money, or put in a carbon price. Um, and I would expect Republicans not to be especially happy with any of those three, but they're going to like the carbon price, the free market solution. They're going to dislike it a lot less than they'd like the other two options. Um, so I think, I think there's a chance. Um, is it, you know, would I guarantee, oh yeah, we're gonna get a, a bipartisan bill through Congress this year? Of course not. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think there's more room for bipartisanship than, than, than people think. Right. Let me, if I can say, just add on Rob's point, and while I love the EOMN work that uh, CLC and others are doing, trying to build bipartisan support for a carbon tax, they're, of the three options that Rob outlined, uh, the one that actually has an evidence of bipartisan support in the past is spending money on clean energy technology. So we do have, you know, 15 years of track record of bipartisan extension of wind and solar tax credits. Uh, we had bipartisan support of, uh, of a carbon price in a form of 45Q, a tax credit for carbon capture and sequestration. And I think that that's the kind of, while it's not as large in magnitude and effect, as an economy-wide carbon price, uh, that's the area where I would expect to see more legislative action over the next few years. I, I certainly I think wanna... that's the best short-run prospect, but the point you made that the, the magnitude isn't, I mean, that's not thats not anywhere near the scale that's gonna be necessary. And and I think there's gonna be more and more pressure to, to go beyond that kind of scale. Um, so, but we'll see. Wanna... Pile on. I mean, so I, I love also love the work uh, Climate Leadership Count is doing, and I do think that carbon dividend or pricing really could make a lot of sense. But I think you made some things that, that I see a bit as overclaims that it's necessarily the most cost effective or that it's necessary. So the fact is, we have solved major environmental problems. The Clean Air Act cost peak around 0.7 or so percent of GDP, real money, not that dissimilar from the kind of money we need to spend on climate. We manage problems like global ozone, air pollution, lead, DDT, et cetera. None of those use pricing mechanisms. And, um, and, and on the second point, the idea that pricing mechanisms are necessarily the cheapest path is true in a world where technology is fixed forever. And so you can just work your way up the dispatch order, but in a world where technology is not fixed forever, it's not necessarily true. So that was the question, which again, I mean, someone like Kay may have views on, or you may all have views on, which is basically, should we stop messing around with incentives and just get heavy handed with regulation instead? I mean, I, I think I think it's 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 not the fun answer, but I think a combination is where we have to go. I mean, in, in California, we have a combination of of standards, of incentives, of regulation and of a pricing system. And it's been a, a decent combination. I will admit fully that it, we are not meeting our goals at this moment. And so we, we need to do more. My worry about doing more through regulation is that I think it it undermines the political engagement that we need. And I'm not talking about members of Congress right now. I'm talking about just public support 
um, in, in, and I say this from a state perspective where many things happen through the ballot. So there's actually a real link between what the public thinks and what we end up doing in Sacramento. Um, and, uh, and I think that regulation without thoughtful transition strategy, which by definition has got to involve some investment is, is a problem. Um, if you just throw it out there and you sort of hope everybody will adjust and that the market will will hit the goals that you've set out or the regulatory structure you've set out, um, you end up with a number of things happening, uh, potentially um, uh, potentially people leaving the state um, in terms of the business side. But I think even more significant is potentially leaving particular communities behind because it is in fact part of the transition strategy to make sure that it's inclusive that you're you're, you have a strategy where current workers in some of the industries that are declining through regulation actually have a pathway. So, so I, I think I really do think it's a mix. And just to the point on investment, I mean, really, really agree that a large chunk of it and it, where we've seen a lot of bipartisan support has been through incentives. But absolutely, Rob is right that we can't do it all through that. Um, and I'm just going to put in another plug for for catalyzing private investment. I mean, I think at globally, we have a trillion dollar gap between gov what governments can do and what's needed. We have to, um, we're, a fa we're fans in California of things like the Green Bank, where you're actually creating structures that allow the government to strategically use money to de-risk private investment where that, where the private market isn't taking on that risk. I think there's a lot of opportunity there. The European Green Deal is providing an interesting model for how to do that at scale. And so I think we're just we're looking at that as a really exciting opportunity, but honestly, I think we've got to look at a combination of policies at this point, just as we have to look at a combination of technologies. Rob, I can see you went, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I guess I'll jump in. The, the, so I, I, I think, I guess two points to make. Um, first, uh, David's all absolutely right that in a world where technology matters, a carbon price by itself isn't the most cost-effective policy. The most cost-effective policy is a carbon price plus um, some technology push. Um, that there, there are multiple market failures there. The, the, the emissions externality and the R&D technology issue, and you need to be pushing on both. Um, and and that's absolutely um, it's very important. A, a point Kate made about the the transition and the, the people who are being left behind, I, I think, is also enormously important. Um, that you know, you, both because we have a moral responsibility to take care of those people and it's politically essential um, because they're, they're gonna be strongly opposed. A key point I'd make on emissions pricing is it actually gives you some money to deal with those problems. Um, now you can't spend all the money on a dividend and spend the money on the R&D subsidy and spend the money on the transition assistance that, that you've gotta be sort of dividing it out across those things. But at least you have money coming in, whereas a lot of the, the command and control regulations don't bring in any revenue. So that money to cover your transition or your technology subsidy has to come from some, somewhere else, um, or you have to run even larger deficits. Right. I just uh, I just want to jump on one thing. I think I think that's true. And uh, as I said at the beginning, we're we're cer certainly experiencing those budget pressures right now in California, where we're dealing with all of these things simultaneously. I will say, and again, I think this goes to the sort of whole of government approach on climate. Um, one thing that's increasingly, I think, clear from, from all the countries dealing with these issues, which is pretty much everybody, is that um, if you let everything stay in your regulatory agencies, your environmental regulatory agencies, if they, if they are in control of the entire climate agenda, then you risk having regulatory, environmental regulatory agencies designing things like economic diversification strategies for just transition, which is just not a good idea um, because they're different skills. People have different skill sets coming into government. And I think it just goes to, this has to be an economic development agenda. This has to be a fiscal agenda. Really people with the skills working, working with what has been best practices in each of those areas really need to be brought to bear on this problem uh, because it is kind of, it is a whole of, you know, government problem, it's a whole of economics problem. Um, Kate, while we have you just on that point, um, question from someone watching about the question of the, Cal the, the, the California Department of Forestry and Fire issued reports about each fire. They consistently describe issues with, in terms of electrical lines, not climate change. Should 
the not come out and talk about climate change instead of talking about electrical lines is was this all about pg and e or was it actually about climate change <laughs> well it's it's a false dichotomy i guess i mean i i will say the board of forestry and cal fire which is our state firefighting agency talk about climate change all the time and the reason they do is because the conditions that have been created by very wet followed by very dry years in california is that you get a lot of vegetation in the wetter years and then it dries out in the drier years what climate change does in part is leads to these extreme precipitation patterns that provide for drier dries and wetter wets. Um, yes, indeed, the power lines are what creates the electrical spark that then sets that all on fire. Um, but the conditions on the ground that make those fires as, as um, intense as they are combined with high winds, which are also climate driven, um, are significant. Now, I, I will be honest and say that in California, I mean, people often say you should learn from Southern Australia. They're doing all these great things on fire, which we do, and we have a great relationship with them. One million people live in all of Southern Australia. 11 million Californians live in high fire risk zones. So we have a development issue. We have developed into these areas in part because people are seeking affordable housing, honestly. We've developed into these areas. It's something we have to take really seriously whether we can keep doing that and keep requiring our utilities to serve those places with power lines or whether there's a different way forward. So that's another piece of the puzzle. So agree with the questioner that there are multiple pieces to this puzzle, but the reality is that the conditions on the ground and the wind conditions are significant when it comes to how the fires behave and how many there are. Right, that's fascinating. Um, I'd like to ask one other quick question to David, which is about the geoengineering and say, you know, have you laid out a reason as to why this kind of approach could be adopted in countries like the US, but what about places like China? What are they doing over there? And maybe Trevor would like to jump in there as well. So I don't think geoengineering, so, so um, solar geoengineering, the idea of putting, making the earth more reflective um, is, is, seems to be, at least most methods, um, cheap enough that it's something in range of, of you know, most nations, including even relatively poor nations. So I think the question of how it happens is really about power politics and legitimacy, and also about the kinds of checks and balances in each country. So if I had to guess, I actually don't think it's that likely that the U.S. is an early adopter, but it's very hard to say. These are things that inherently raise very hard global governance problems. And I didn't say the central concern about solar geoengineering and the, the reason it's been so rightfully controversial are really concerns about addiction, about the idea that it will provide an excuse for people to do less on emissions cuts. And that's the central challenge. I think it's a reality. And I think part of the way forward is to, to live with that reality, but also to look for ways in policy to couple decisions around solar geoengineering to rapid action to cut emissions at a nation by nation level. Right, Trevor. Yes. Yeah, I guess the only thing, I mean, uh, David's a, a geoengineering ex expert. The one kind of insight from the climate economics research that I think underscores David's point on governance is that there is no single temperature that is optimal for everyone on the planet, right? The optimal temperature, if you were Sweden, global temperature is very different than the optimal temperature if you are India. And so if we at some point had a technology viable thermostat on the climate where we could just choose where to set it, all countries would choose to set that thermostat at different places, right? For Sweden, Sweden would be better off if we continued to increase in temperatures, whereas India would be better off if temperatures didn't just return to pre-industrial levels, but went colder than pre-industrial levels. And so that raises a bunch of very thorny governance issues that David uh, that David rightly flagged. Just right. to be clear, when Trevor says Sweden would be better off, that means on a purely economic measure, based on some nice econometrics, which are relevant, but discount all the reasons we care about the natural environment, which are real. So, so on, under Trevor's argument, things like national parks wouldn't exist, et cetera. That may be correct, but it's not the way many of us actually think. Right, right. Sorry, Trevor, do you want to come back in there? Yeah, no, I, on other, on non-economic terms, it would as well. I mean, you don't, the, the, it's unclear what the tundra in Canada or in Siberia would be in a warmer world. 
uh, but it's impossible. It's entirely possible that that would be welfare enhancing for the tundra and for uh, northern uh, northern Canada, uh, even if you included a broader measure than just economics. Can I just say quickly? Tundra's well welfare prefers it warmer. This is a very odd argument. I think <laughs> I think that just leave it. Some of us actually care about leaving the environment more the way it was, protecting nature in the old-fashioned sense. Can I just ask a quick question about trees? Because we, we're almost out of time, but there was incredible excitement um, at Davos last year about the Trillion Tree Initiative and this idea that, you know, because people are so desperately looking for, you know, a silver bullet or a magic wand. And we have people like Mark Benioff stand up and say that we all need to plant trees. President Donald Trump got excited about that one too. Is that the answer or is that just another kind of red herring or distraction? I mean, again, it's it's an answer among many, many, many answers. It's not a silver bullet. I will say just to be to to be positive about this, because I think trees are great. I, we love trees. Um, we want them to stop burning as much in California, but we love them. Um, I really think one of the I would love to see that initiative really focus. And I think Mark Benioff is doing this to a great extent on urban forestry. And one of the reasons for that is that one of the, the single biggest mortality killer, uh, the, the single biggest killer from a mortality rate perspective of climate impacts is extreme heat, actually. And extreme heat is a much bigger deal in low income parts, even of our US cities. It, there's a lot of data on the, the reality that trees are planted in higher income parts of cities and not in lower income parts of cities. I would love to see a really focused initiative to, to change that trend because it would be good for so many things. It would be good from a health perspective. It would be good from a, a very small level, but a carbon uh, uh, sink perspective. And, and it would just, it would be a, that sort of intersection of resilience and, and, and mitigation. But I think it's really dangerous to ever grab onto any one solution um, because this is a multifaceted problem and it plays out really differently in different parts of the world. Two, well, facts, and a, two facts and a hypothesis. One fact is that if you look at the change in atmospheric carbon burden since 1850, which is the thing that drives climate, only about 5% of that has had anything to do with carbon back and forth in the biosphere. It's fundamentally a problem of human fossil fuel and cement emissions. So second thing, if you plant trees, the carbon can easily come back out with change policy or climate change. And so you don't necessarily reduce long run risk. You may have built yourself a kind of a carbon stock that comes out with climate change later in the century, adding to risk. And then third, a hypothesis, Maybe this was because folks at Davos were really excited about doing something to save the planet, but maybe it was because they were doing something that made it look like there was easy action that they could get behind that wasn't actually much more than symbolic. Well, I think that's a very good moment on which to end, which is in some ways both encouraging and discouraging. The good news is that things like tree planting initiatives and eye catchy, you know, sort of um, thrilling declarations like a trillion trees do indicate that the zeitgeist changing in the sense that people are now waking up and realizing that it is serious and they need to do something about it and even the once completely far-fetched concept of a bipartisan measure or movement on climate change in the coming years is no longer entire as quite as far-fetched as it was before um, you know, we've all learned in the last few years that we have to not just imagine the once unimaginable, but actually see it materialize for both good and bad. And the zeitgeist is indeed changing, which is encouraging. That's the good news. The bad news is that I think this panel has laid out very clearly the magnitude of the change and the challenge and the seriousness of what will happen if we don't address it. But also the fact, the nasty, unpleasant truth that there isn't a single magic wand. It's gonna require a lot of trade-offs, a very grown up um, serious policy conversation, not just with the US government, but with governments around the world at every levels. It really is to use a wonderful British phrase that you've probably been watching in the crown and all hands on deck moment. Um, and that's gonna be extremely hard to organize. But that is exactly why the Aspen Institute um, exists, which is to try and have these conversations across different stakeholders, dare I say, different political parties and different parts of government and academia. So thank you all very much indeed for chipping in with your thoughts and ideas. Thank you to Secretary Paulson for rallying everyone.
And now I'll hand over to the um, organizers for the next stage in the program. So thank you. Great, thank you so much, Jillian. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks guys. Kate, David, Trevor, thanks for sharing your expertise and your time with us. Um, I'm just here to wrap up our program for today. Um, thank all of our panelists and all of our authors. Thank you to the participants who, who stuck with us on Zoom this afternoon. And I encourage you again to please go to the website, economicstrategygroup.org, where you could request a free copy of the book or download a free copy of the PDF. Um, Thanks for being with us and being part of these substantive, rigorous, bipartisan conversations.